Chapter 1 of Tick Tock of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. Tick Tock of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 1 Anne's Army. I won't, cried Anne. I won't sweep the floor. It is beneath my dignity. Someone must sweep it, replied Anne's younger sister, Sally else we shall soon be wading in dust. And you are the eldest and the head of the family. I'm Queen of Oogaboo, cried Anne proudly. <sighs> but, she added with a sigh, my kingdom is the smallest and the poorest in all the land of Oz. This was quite true. Away up in the mountains, in a far corner of the beautiful fairyland of Oz, lies a small valley which is named Oogaboo. And in this valley lived a few people who were usually happy and contented and never cared to wander over the mountain pass into the more settled parts of the land. They knew that all of Oz, including their own territory, was ruled by a beautiful princess named Ozma, who lived in a splendid emerald city. Yet the simple folk of Oogaboo never visited Ozma. They had a royal family of their own, not especially to rule over them, but just as a matter of pride. Ozma permitted the various parts of her country to have kings and queens and emperors and the like, but all were ruled over by the lovely girl queen of the Emerald City. The king of Oogaboo used to be a man named Joel Jemkiff Soforth, who for many years did all the drudgery of deciding disputes and telling his people when to plant cabbages and pickle onions. But the king's wife had a sharp tongue and small respect for the king. Therefore, one night, King Joel crept over the pass into the land of Oz and disappeared from Oogaboo for good and all. The queen waited a few years for him to return and then started in search of him, leaving her eldest daughter, Anne Soforth, to act as queen. Now, Anne had not forgotten when her birthday came, for that meant a party and feasting and dancing, but she had quite forgotten how many years the birthday marked. In a land where people live always, this is not considered a cause for regret, so we may justly say that Queen Anne of Oogaboo was old enough to make jelly, and let it go at that. But she didn't make jelly, or do any more of the housework than she could help. She was an ambitious woman, and constantly resented the fact that her kingdom was so tiny and her people so stupid and uninteresting. Often she wondered what had become of her father and mother, out beyond the pass, in the wonderful land of Oz, and the fact that they had not returned to Oogaboo led Anne to suspect that they had found a better place to live. So when Sally refused to sweep the floor of the living room of the palace, and Anne would not sweep it either, she said to her sister, I'm going away. This absurd kingdom of Oogaboo tires me. Go, if you want answered Sally, but you are very foolish to leave this place. Why? asked Anne. Because in the land of Oz, which is Ozma's country, you will be a nobody. Here you are a queen. Oh, yes, queen over eighteen men, twenty-seven women, and forty-four children, returned Anne bitterly. Well, there are certainly more people than that in the great land of Oz, laughed Sally. Ha! Huh, why don't you raise an army and conquer them and be queen of all Oz? she asked, trying to taunt Anne and so to anger her. Then she made a face at her sister and went to the backyard to swing in the hammock. Her jeering words, however, had given Queen Anne an idea. She reflected that Oz was reported to be a peaceful country, and Ozma a mere girl who ruled them with gentleness to all and was obeyed because the people loved her. Even in Oogaboo the story was told that Ozma's sole army consisted of twenty-seven fine officers who wore beautiful uniforms but carried no weapons because there was no one to fight. Once there had been a private soldier besides the officers, but Ozma had made him a captain general and taken away his gun for fear it might accidentally hurt someone. The more Anne thought about the matter, the more she was convinced it would be easy to conquer the land of Oz and set herself up as ruler in Ozma's place, if she had but an army to do it with. Afterwards, she would go out into the world and conquer other lands, and then perhaps she could make a way to the moon and conquer that. She had a warlike spirit that preferred trouble to idleness. It all depended on an army, Anne decided. She carefully counted in her mind all the men of her kingdom. Yes, there were exactly eighteen of them, all told. They would not make a very big army, but by surprising Ozma's unarmed officer, her men might easily subdue him. Gentle people are always afraid of those that bluster, Anne told herself. I don't wish to shed blood, for that would shock my nerves and I might faint. But if we threaten and flash our weapons, I am sure the people of Oz will fall upon their knees before me and surrender. This argument, which she repeated to herself more than once, finally determined the Queen of Oogaboo to undertake the audacious venture. Whatever happened, she reflected, 
can make me no more unhappy than my staying shut up in this miserable valley and sweeping floors and quarreling with my sister Sally. So I will venture all and win what I may. That very day she started out to organize her army. The first man she came to was Joe Apple, so called because he had an apple orchard. Joe, said Anne, I am going to conquer the world and I want you to join my army. Don't ask me to do such a fool thing, for I must politely refuse your majesty, said Joe Apple. I have no intention of asking you. I shall command you as Queen of Oogaboo to join, said Anne. In that case, I suppose I must obey, the man remarked in a sad voice. But I pray you to consider that I am a very important citizen, and for that reason am entitled to an office of high rank. You shall be a general, promised Anne. With gold epaulets and a sword, he asked. Of course, said the queen. Then she went to the next man, whose name was Joe Bunn, as he owned an orchard where grain buns and wheat buns, in great variety, both hot and cold, grew on trees. Joe, said Anne, I am going to conquer the world, and I command you to join my army. Impossible, he exclaimed. The bun crop has to be picked. Let your wife and children do the picking, said Anne. But I am a man of great importance, your majesty, he protested. For that reason you shall be one of my generals, and wear a cocked hat with gold braid, and curl your mustaches and clank a long sword, she promised. So he consented, although sorely against his will, and the queen walked on to the next cottage. Here lived Joe Cone, so called because the trees in his orchard bore crops of excellent ice cream cones. Joe, said Anne, I am going to conquer the world and you must join my army. Excuse me, please, said Joe Cone. I am a bad fighter. My good wife conquered me years ago, for she can fight better than I can. Take her, your majesty, instead of me, and I'll bless you for the favor. This must be an army of men, fierce, ferocious warriors, declared Anne, looking sternly upon the mild little man. And you will leave my wife here in Oogaboo? he asked. Yes, and make you a general. I'll go, said Joe Cone. And Anne went on to the cottage of Joe Clock, who had an orchard of clock trees. This man at first insisted that he would not join the army, but Queen Anne's promise to make him a general finally won his consent. How many generals are there in your army? he asked. Four so far, replied Anne. And how big will the army be? was his next question. I intend to make every one of the eighteen men in Ugamu join it, she said. Then four generals are enough, announced Joe Clark. I advise you to make the rest of them colonels. Anne tried to follow his advice. The next four men she visited, who were Joe Plum, Joe Egg, Joe Banjo, and Joe Cheese, named after the trees in their orchards, she made colonels of her army. But the fifth one, Joe Nails, said colonels and generals were getting to be altogether too common in the army of Ugaboo, and he preferred to be a major. So Joe Nails, Joe Cake, Joe Ham, and Joe Stockings were all four made majors, while the next four Joes, Sandwich, Padlocks, Sunday, and Buttons, were appointed captains of the army. But now Queen Anne was in a quandary. There remained but two other men in all Oogaboo, and if she made these two lieutenants, while there were four captains, four majors, four colonels, and four generals, there was likely to be jealousy in her army, and perhaps mutiny, and possibly desertions. One of these men, however, was Joe Candy, and he would not go at all. No promises could tempt him, nor threats could move him. He said he must remain at home to harvest his crop of Jackson balls, lemon drops, bonbons, and chocolate creams. Also, he had large fields of Cracker Jack and buttered popcorn to be mowed and threshed, and he was determined not to disappoint the children of Oogaboo by going away to conquer the world and so let the candy crop spoil. Finding Joe Candy so obstinate, Queen Anne let him have his own way and continued her journey to the house of the 18th and last man in Oogaboo, who was a young man named Joe Files. This Files had twelve trees which bore steel files of various sorts, but he also had nine book trees on which grew a choice selection of storybooks. In case you have never seen books growing upon trees, I will explain that those in Joe Files' orchard were enclosed in broad green husks, which when fully ripe turned to a deep red color. Then the books were picked and husked and were ready to read. If they were picked too soon, the stories would be found to be confused and uninteresting and, sp and the spelling very bad. However, if allowed to ripen perfectly, the stories were fine reading and the spelling and grammar excellent. Files freely gave his books to all who wanted them, but the people of Oogaboo cared little for books, and so he had to read most of them himself before they spoiled. For as you probably know, as soon as the books were read, the words disappeared and the leaves withered and faded which is the worst fault of all books which grow on trees. When Queen Anne spoke to this young man, Files, 
who was both intelligent and ambitious. He said he thought it would be great fun to conquer the world, but he called her attention to the fact that he was far superior to the other men in the army. Therefore, he would not be one of her generals or colonels or majors or captains, but claimed the honor of being sole private. Anne did not like this idea at all. I hate to have a private soldier in my army, she said. They're so common. I'm told that Princess Ozma once had a private, but she made him her captain general, which is good evidence that the private was unnecessary. Ozma's army doesn't fight, returned Fylde. But your army must fight like fury in order to conquer the world. I have read in my books that it is always the private soldiers who do the fighting, for no officer is ever brave enough to face the foe. Also, it stands to reason that your officers must have someone to command and to issue their orders to. Therefore, I'll be the one. I long to slash and slay the enemy and to become a hero. Then we will return to Urgabu, I'll take all the marbles away from the children and melt them up and make a marble statue of myself for all to look upon and admire. Anne was much pleased with Private Files. He seemed indeed to be such a warrior as she needed in her enterprise, and her hope of success took a sudden bound when Files told her he knew where a gun tree grew and would go there at once and pick the ripest and biggest musket the tree bore. End of chapter one. Recording by Ryan T. Somewhere in North Carolina on the 11th of February, 2007.